a pleasure to be here. Uh, Soren has wanted me to come to this meeting for many years, and I haven't been able to. And so this is my first meeting, and it really is a joy to be among so many friends and, and new acquaintances. Uh, I'm a psychologist and a neuroscientist by training. And I had the great fortune early in my career to be around some people whose demeanor and whose presence was really infectious to me. These were the kind of people I wanted to spend more time around. They were very warm-hearted, they were very kind, uh, and they were not my professors at William James Hall at Harvard. Uh, they were people I was lucky enough to meet on the outside. And one of the things that they all had in common that uh, I began to learn about was a practice, uh, an interest in, in a practice of meditation. And after my second year of graduate school, I went off to India for the first time to get a little taste of what this might be about. And this was back in the mid-1970s. And I came back from that, um, from three months in Asia, from in, in India and Sri Lanka, with a fervent conviction that this kind of work was so important for Western science to embrace and to investigate and that these were practices that can offer psychology, medicine, neuroscience, which was neuroscience was just beginning then, um, something really important. And I began to do research on this topic back in those days. But it was made very clear to me, I was told in no uncertain terms, Richie, if you want a successful career in science, this is a terrible way to begin. And so I was a dutiful student, and I began to study the brain and emotion, which is still very much what I do today. And I think it's fair to say that for a good 20 years, most of my professional colleagues had absolutely no idea that in the privacy of other domains, I was pursuing my practice of meditation and interest in this area. I was a closet meditator for 20 years. And my life changed in 1992. It changed when I first met His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, we met with him with a small group in Dharamsala, India at his residence. And he challenged me on that day in 1992 and he said, you've used tools of modern neuroscience to study anxiety and depression and fear. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And it was a wake-up call for me. And I made a commitment to His Holiness on that day that I was going to come out of the closet and uh, do everything I could to put compassion and kindness squarely within the crosshairs of mainstream science. And uh, this, is, this is very much what we've been doing since then. Now, let me just say a little bit about why pursuing this work today is so different than it was when I began in the mid-1970s. There are four major developments in modern science which have enabled this work to go forward. And I'd like to just name those four themes because they're so central to all of this work. The first is neuroplasticity. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard this word, and it simply means that the brain changes in response to experience and in response to training. Most of the time, the brain is changing unwittingly. Most of the time, we are being pushed and pulled by the forces around us and not engaged in the intentional shaping of our brains. And a central theme of my remarks today is that this is an invitation to take more responsibility to intentionally cultivate our brains in ways that can promote well-being and healthy habits of mind. We can take advantage of neuroplasticity and intentionally shape our brains for the good. So that's the first theme. The second theme is the equivalent of neuroplasticity in the realm of genomics. And here I'm referring to the science of epigenetics. 
And epigenetics is the science of how genes are regulated, how genes are expressed. And you can think of genes having little volume controls that go from low to high. And while we're all born with a fixed complement of base pairs that constitute our DNA, the extent to which a gene is turned on or turned off is highly dynamic and can be impacted by experience. We know, for example, from hard-nosed biological research that the way a mother interacts with her offspring can significantly impact the regulation of genes in the brains of the offspring. And the regulation, the alteration of gene expression can persist for the entire duration of that offspring's life based on these early interactions between the mother and her baby. Just last year, we published for the first time in a major scientific paper, the first evidence showing that if we bring long-term meditation practitioners into the laboratory and we <clears throat> simply take blood samples before and after a day of intensive practice over the course of eight hours, we actually were able to show that over the course of just this eight hours of practice, we can see evidence of a measurable alteration in gene expression. And so just eight hours of practice is sufficient to induce an alteration in gene expression through purely mental practice. And this is very much a proof of concept. There's much more work to be done, but this underscores how dynamic these systems are. We once thought that both the brain and our genomics were basically fixed. And if there was change in development, it was basically kind of decomposition and degeneration over the course of development. We now know that those views are just completely wrong and that there is much more plasticity in these systems than we ever would have imagined. And in the brain, we know, for example, that one form of plasticity was, which, was, which we were taught never existed when we were students is the growth of actual new brain cells. It's a process called neurogenesis. So those are the first two themes, neuroplasticity and epigenetics. The third theme is the information that is now available on the bi-directional highways that exist between the brain and the body. We are learning much more about how our brains can regulate systemic biological systems and how alterations in the body will feed back and impact the mind and the brain. And so it is through these bi-directional highways that we now have very good evidence to show that high levels of well-being are actually associated with better physical health. The data on this are very, very clear. The best research comes from studies of British civil servants in large epidemiological samples, where there's no doubt of this association. Precisely how, what the mechanisms are, are still very much being investigated. But the fact that they exist is very clear. And so this invites the suggestion that cultivating well-being through transforming our mind will change the brain in ways that can impact the body that may have beneficial consequences for our physical health. It also enables us to think about how alterations in the body through various body-oriented therapies and practices may feed back and influence the mind and the brain in ways that are beneficial and salubrious. So that's the third theme. The fourth theme is probably the most controversial of these four, but one that I really uh, love to talk about because I think it has tremendously important implications. And the fourth theme is that we come into the world, human beings come into the world with innate, basic goodness. I'll say it again.
we all come into the world with innate basic goodness. And what I mean by that is that early in life, if you give an infant a choice between a warm-hearted, altruistic encounter compared with an encounter that is selfish and aggressive, the data are unequivocal. Infants six months of age clearly show a preference for the altruistic and warm-hearted encounter. Now, we can, how do we know that? Well, we can ask a six-month-old baby. Now, how do we ask a six-month-old baby? Well, one of the ways that we can ask a six-month-old baby is by actually using very sophisticated eye-tracking technology. We can use infrared technology to track exactly where a baby's eyes are fixated. And you can show video clips to a baby, you can have actual live encounters, and you can monitor where the baby prefers to look. And the data are so clear that infants as young as six months of age have a very strong preference for looking at altruistic and warm-hearted encounters. Now, there's a lot more evidence along these lines, and I should say also that this evidence is not restricted to human beings. There is now growing evidence to suggest that other species exhibit this kind of preference for innate basic goodness as well. So one of the reasons why this is so important and interesting is that in, as many of you know, in the contemplative traditions, when we engage in practices that are designed to cultivate kindness and compassion, we're not actually creating something de novo. We're not actually creating uh, something that didn't already exist. What we're doing is recognizing and strengthening, nurturing a quality that was there from the outset. And in this sense, I often say that qualities like kindness and compassion are very much like language. We're all born with a biological predisposition for language. But research shows that we need to be raised in a linguistic community in order for that biological propensity to become expressed. There are case studies of feral children raised in the wild who do not develop normal language because they've not been exposed to a normal linguistic community. And it may be very similar for compassion, that the seeds of compassion are there from the start, but in order for them to flourish, we need a a uh, compassionate community for those seeds to be nurtured. So those are the four themes, neuroplasticity, epigenetics, the bi-directional highways that exist between the brain and the body, and innate basic goodness. Those four themes have enabled work in contemplative science and contemplative neuroscience particularly to flourish over the last decade in ways that would have been unimaginable were it not for uh, these other developments in modern science, which provide a framework, a foundation, uh, and um, methods to investigate how these contemplative practices exert their effects. So uh, just to sort of go back in a, a little bit in, in personal history, after I first met the Dalai Lama, we then began to reorient our work and focus it in these ways and begin to investigate the impact of these contemplative practices on the brain and the body in many different contexts, many different populations. And I'd like to just give you a flavor of a couple of them and then say what we've learned about the science of well-being from these kinds of studies. So we have done a variety of research uh, of a basic nature in the laboratory with long-term meditation practitioners. And one of the um, experiments that we did, and I'll say a little bit about this experiment, uh, investigated qualities that we think are particularly important for well-being that I'll comment on in more detail in a few minutes. In this particular experiment, we presented painful stimuli 
to long-term practitioners. We have different ways of torturing people in our laboratory. Um, and uh, we try to do it with tremendous respect uh, and um, gratitude uh, uh, and uh, also do it very safely. Uh, and one of the ways that we can probe the brain and its response to adversity is with physical pain. And uh, one of the kinds of realistic stimuli that we use in the lab is heat. Um, it's, it's real heat, but we can deliver it very, very safely. And we, we have a special device through which very rapidly circulating water goes, and we can regulate the temperature of the water to a tenth of a degree centigrade, and we can change the temperature extremely quickly. Uh, and so it's, um, it enables us to deliver heat in a very safe way that is very, very realistic. It produces a real burning sensation but it um, doesn't actually injure a person. So uh, we did this with very long-term meditation practitioners in the laboratory, and we did it in the following context. We presented a cue to the practitioners that indicated that in 10 seconds, they were going to get zapped with this really painful stimulus. Now, we gave them a hit of this painful stimulus before they started, so they knew what they were getting. So they got a cue which said, in 10 seconds, you're going to get this painful stimulus. And then they got the painful stimulus. And then there was a period of recovery immediately after the pain was delivered. And they, we did this in the MRI scanner. We were monitoring their brain. Now, we had a group of age and gender match controls who were not meditators. And we did the same thing to them. Now, when you present the cue, just a little tone that denotes that in 10 seconds, you're about to get zapped. Can you imagine what happened to the non-meditators? Well, I'm sure you're imagining correctly. Just presenting that tone after they, they got an initial hit of the pain and it, uh, when they first came in, then they get the tone, and their brains go haywire in response to the tone. The, we know a fair amount about the circuits in the brain that activate in response to pain, and when we presented that tone, all of those circuits began to activate without the actual pain being delivered. And there were all kinds of changes occurring in their body. And then in the period immediately after the painful stimulus went off, in the controls, their pain circuits kept activating. They didn't recover. They persisted in their activation. In the long-term practitioners, there was very little activity during the anticipation period when they got the tone. In response to the heat itself, they showed actually a very large response in many areas of the brain. And then in the recovery period, they showed very little activity. And it turns out that their reports of distress and suffering were primarily associated with the activity occurring during this anticipation and recovery periods. And so the long-term practitioners had this very sharp inverted V-shaped function, very little activity in anticipation, very little activity in recovery, but a big response to the painful stimulus itself. So they exhibited um, something that is we have identified as one very important constituent of well-being, which is the ability to rapidly recover from adversity. So I'd like now to list, from a neuroscientific perspective, four characteristics of well-being, or four elementary constituents of well-being that have all been supported by hard-nosed neuroscientific research. And the good news, folks, is that each of these four is plastic. That is, it can be, it can be regulated through training. This year, in 2015, um, there will be the third United Nations report on world happiness. Uh, there will be a press conference in New York City on April 24th of this year at which the 2015 report on happiness will be released. In the previous two reports, this is the third one, the previous two reports were all co-authored by economists. And um, this year, um, they brought yours truly in uh, so I'm the lone non-economist. 
Uh, and so for the first time in the World Happiness Report, there actually are, uh, there's mention of compassion and also of meditation uh, for the first time. Uh, thank you. It's, it's amazing the, the nooks and crannies in which we can insert the Dharma. Um, so, uh, uh, so in this report, we talk about these four constituents of well-being. So one is we call resilience, the ability to rapidly recover from adversity. The second constituent of well-being is in many ways the flip side, and that is the ability to have a background glow of positive emotion, or another way to think about it is continuously reminding ourselves of innate basic goodness and having that infuse all of our interactions. Now, each of these is associated with very specific brain circuits that have been identified in neuroscientific research. The third constituent of well-being is generosity. The most effective way to activate circuits in the brain associated with well-being and positive emotion is through generosity. And the data are really strong. So this is not a theory. This is hard-nosed neuroscientific evidence. And the fourth constituent of well-being from a neuroscientific perspective is attention, the inverse of mind-wandering. When people are mind-wandering, they typically report that their emotions are dysphoric. When people are in the groove, in the flow, when they're in the present moment, they have much higher reports of well-being. Each of these four constituents is mediated by different circuits in the brain. Each of these circuits exhibits a lot of plasticity. With regard to the fourth component, this is a component that I've been interested in for many years, and my interest was first kindled when I read William James's Principles of Psychology, the famous two-volume tome that was published in 1890. And in that book, he has a chapter that's devoted exclusively to attention. And he said in that chapter on attention, he said the following, and this is a quote from William James. He said, the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. And then he went on to say, but it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. I think if William James had more intimate familiarity with the contemplative traditions, he would have instantaneously seen that these were methods that can be used to educate attention. A recent study published in a major scientific journal used smartphones to sample people's experience in the world, and they asked people several questions. They asked them, what are you doing right now? And they had to check off on a list of activities. And the second question is, where is your mind right now? Is it focused on what you're doing, or is it focused elsewhere? And the third question that they asked them is, how happy are you or unhappy are you right at this moment? And what was found in this study, this was a sample of thousands of people, what was found is that the average American adult spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. Folks, we could do better. Even if it's just a smidgen better, we could do better. And when they were not paying attention to what they're doing, they reported that they were unhappy. So let me end with just telling a little story. I was in Dharamsala with His Holiness the Dalai Lama on one occasion, and during a tea break, I was with him with just one other person, so just the three of us, and there was this, the person who was with me was this really crazy Japanese scientist. Um, 
And the Japanese scientist leans over and he said to His Holiness, Your Holiness, can you please tell us the time in your life when you were the most happy? And I thought, that was re that's a really interesting question. And just like that, His Holiness said, Right now! <laughs> Thank you very much.